I'm going to talk about the fact that we hear often that we get bombarded by information, too much information, too fast, all the time. It's, 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 it's everywhere from the TV, from the web, and everything. And uh, today, I, I would just like to say, let's go beyond information. Let's go beyond knowledge and see what's on the other side. I've got a few ideas I've been doodling with in the past few years. I'm, uh, you know, I think uh, I, I'm really, you know, I'm happy with the doodling of those ideas. And uh, along the way, you'll see a few lessons on you always have to publish your stuff when you think about it. All right. This is going to be an audience participation uh, TED Talk. So I want you involved. Uh, as you'll see, the internet is going to be important in what I'm going to discuss. So I want any time that you hear me say, and how do I know this? That you yell to the top of your lung, it's on the web! OK? <laughs> Let, let's try a practice run, because you know when it's actually needed, I need you all there. Um, hey, I learned that Tiger Wood and Lindsey Vaughn are an item. How do I know that? <laughs> all right, OK. All right, practice makes perfect. Let's try a second time. Let's try, uh, hey, Voyager 1 has left the solar system again. How do I know that? <laughs> Very well. So cool. So next time, of course, pay attention because it won't be a drill, and I want you all there. Um, too much information, too fast, drinking from the fire hose. It's not always been like this. Uh, you know, if I were to summarize communications in like 30 seconds, I'd say, well, speech probably started 100,000 years ago in sub-Saharan Africa uh, in the Middle Stone Age, and then uh, went along for a while until finally f people figured out to write by drawing. That was like maybe in the Neolithic 7,000 years ago. Uh, they scratched their, their drawings until somebody figured, gee, maybe something alphabetic-like might be good. And then they came up with, uh, with, with actual writing in, uh, in about 34 to 3200 BC. Uh, that was Sumeria and Egypt, you know, two foci of civilization back then. And uh, for a while, that's all they did, right? You had monks writing down in the monastery these books. Until Gutenberg came along, at least in the West, there might have been other things in the East, but in the West, Gutenberg came along with the movable type. And then you can spoof, poof, 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 print books. And it's been like that for a while until right now in the 21st century, we tippity type away on our keyboards and generate lots of information. The very self same information we think is too much and too fast. So I'm a physicist. I don't know that stuff. I just told you how the whole history of communication in 30 seconds. How do I know this? Exactly. It's on the web. I looked it up. Somebody had done all the work for me. It was a no-brainer. I just looked it up, and I, I could manage to make something understandable in 30 seconds. And that's, that's fantastic. And by the way, the fact that pretty much everything is available on the web, all the information and knowledge you might want, is spelling the end of the bar bet. <laughs> You're in a bar. Your friend Joe says, hey, Mark. Hey, who threw the most touchdown in a single season in the NFL? I think it's Peyton Manning. He's awesome. Well, fine. I grab my cell phone. Boop, boop, beep, boop, beep, boop. I figure out in 10 seconds that he's wrong. It's Tom Brady, graduate of the University of Michigan, who in 2007 threw 50, beating Peyton Manning's record from the year before of 49. The bar bet is gone. Trivia is gone. It's useless. Knowing stuff, you know, basic stuff is kind of useless. You can look it up. So when I was asked about what I would talk at a TED talk, I thought exactly of that. Well, not, not the bit about the bar bet. The bit about if you have all knowledge and all information in the world, essentially free, if you have a down connection to download it, right? OK. Essentially free, where's the value? Where's the value of all that knowledge? How can you go beyond information and beyond knowledge to what's actually valuable. And that's what I'd like to talk about today. Uh, first bit about irony, and you should publish your stuff when you think about it. It turns out I, I discovered I'm not the, uh, the first person to say that. Information is cheap. I, uh, <laughs> just depressing, really. Uh, I Googled it up. I figured, OK, I'm preparing for a TED talk. I better Google it up. Information is free. Somebody else thought about it. 
I was pretty happy with that idea. Uh, anyway, a guy called George Dixon, a very well-known science historian, actually, uh, said it in an issue of the European on the 26th of October, 2007, uh, 2011. There you go. So, okay, fine. Uh, one part of my TED Talk has been thought about. <laughs> okay, meaning one. Okay, fine. Let's continue then. Maybe we'll find some other type of, uh, of, of value to add. So, moving on, I'd like to then say, how do we go beyond knowledge and, and information? And for that, we need to actually look at the value chain of knowledge. So look at the screen. A dot is a zero-dimensional point, and it can mean anything you want. But if you put a number underneath, if you put a number underneath a dot, it becomes data. It's a piece of data. It's a datum, if you want. And data is great. I mean, it's, a, uh, it's the smallest part of information you could ever have. It's the answer to the question, what? Oh, what height? What temperature? What time? If you find the answer to that question, you get a piece of data. All right, OK, it's the beginning. It's not big, it's very small. If we then expand on data, if we start putting data together, organizing it, making it make sense, you get more of a one-dimensional thing I'll call information. It's the second step. Information is the answer to the questions, uh, who, where, when, how, well, who's in charge, where is she? When is she back? How can I get in contact with her? And that's a little bit more than data, but it's still pretty, pretty simple. This information is pretty simple. If you take it up a notch and add another dimension, you can get a plane. I, I'll represent it by a plane on the screen. <laughs> and it's meant to, it's in gray. It's, it's, it's in of black and white. It's in shade of gray of which my female friends tell me there are 50. I don't know. The, um, imagine a gray, a gray, bumpy, uh, lumpy kind of thing, a bit like Mike's data from earlier. Um, and that's, that's knowledge. You put data and information together, you shake it up in your head, you compare, you infer, you extrapolate, and you get knowledge. And uh, it answers the question, why? Why is there matter in the universe? Why is the sky blue? Why did I have to eat that last piece of cheesecake? This is information and, and knowledge. This is knowledge, and it, it's a, where I've gotten this thing, and I'm pretty happy with it. I said, OK, cool, knowledge value chain, data, information, knowledge. You can see. I, uh, turns out knowledge value chain is something that exists already. Uh, Apparently, in 1999, it started to be used for uh, management of information, uh, you know, time of talk. Uh, it's a way for corporations to try to see how can we get value out of data and process it. So in even 2004, a company, a company called T.W. Powell from uh, Manhattan trademarked it. That was my second great idea. I should have published it when I knew it. All right, fine. We can go ahead then. Let's try to add value to this. A bit disappointed in those ideas all of a sudden. What I'm going to do is I'm going to say, let's go beyond knowledge. This is what I said at the beginning. Let's go beyond knowledge. Let's go to wisdom. OK, a bit of a pompous word. You can, use, you can use understanding or meaning if you want. I'll use wisdom. Let's go to wisdom. That, I think, is where value in a world where all the information and the knowledge is essentially available and essentially free, that's where I think the value is. It's in the wisdom. Uh, it, it, it answers the question, why not? And I'll, I'll give an example. Uh, Solomon, King Solomon. I, I'm not on first name basis with him. King Solomon of ancient time. I'm using an example from the Bible. You know, you can use your own book, the Torah, uh, the Quran, the Kama Sutra. All these books have great example of, of wisdom. When Solomon was faced with this whole, you know, it's my child, it's my child, it's my child. The two women beating over the child. He, he didn't look it up on the web. He didn't try to figure out what knowledge he needed to have to deal with this. He said, hey, why not cut the kid in half? And then he got his answer right away. It took 
an understanding of human nature. It took intuition to get there. Wisdom is not something that computers or algorithms can give you. The analysis and synthesis capacity that you need to get to wisdom, I say, is exclusively and exquisitely human. You can't have that mechanically. And I'd like to say that if we don't make a conscious effort in everything we do to add the wisdom to what's already there, we're probably, you know, fated to a rather mediocre life in a mediocre society. And I see uh, a lot of time where it's just easier just to drink from the fire hose and not think too much about it and not go beyond the information and knowledge we get and stay there. I'm saying let's go beyond. So, hey, cool. Data, information, knowledge, wisdom. Now I'm happy I got something new. The wisdom value chain. This is awesome. I googled wisdom value chain. <laughs> I googled value chain and it turns out that this guy, I'm going to read it here, this guy called Colin Mercer from Cultural Capital Limited wrote a paper called, are you ready for this? Called From Data to Wisdom, Building the Knowledge Base for a Cultural Society, or Cultural Policy. And it's all about, you know, uh, cultural policy, so it's not exactly my field. But nonetheless, you got to hear a quote from there. He said, we need to move along and up the knowledge value chain from data to information to knowledge to wisdom. Come on! Come on! Give me a break! I should have published that when I first thought of it. Nonetheless, I'm going to forge on. And you see, it's getting, becoming a little bit meta. I'm, I'm doing a TED Talk on how to add value, and I can't bleed and start putting value in this. But I'm asking us to all go to wisdom. So where is the wisdom found? Well, Descartes said that doubt is the origin of wisdom. Be that as it may, I would think that uh, wisdom is personal and it comes from inside. It's coming from us. It comes fr from you. And you are the source of wisdom. Wisdom is personal because once you come up with a bit of wisdom and you make it public, it's not wisdom anymore to those people. It's just information and knowledge. It's your wisdom, not their wisdom. It's your wisdom. And the reason it's your wisdom is because you came up with it. The value of wisdom is in the coming up of it. It makes you wiser. So what inside us gives us our wisdom? And I'd like to think that I can build here on Charles Taylor, who's a Canadian philosopher of great renown, who operates out of McGill, which is my alma mater. And uh, you know he's written a lot on modernity, what defines the modern identity and the secular world. And, uh, oh, by the way, how do I know this? No, actually, I read it in this book. <laughs> it's called Sources of the Self. It's a, it's a great book. And uh, he tries to cover where, where people get their, their self-identity. Uh, Not individuals, but the modern identity. But I'd like to concentrate on individuals and say, where your sources of yourself is is probably where your wisdom is. And those can be anything like, uh, people define themselves by religion, by work, by science, by nature, by compassion. And I'd like to say, those are your sources. Choose which one they are. And so here's an exercise that you can do at home. You didn't think you could come to a TED Talk and not go back with an exercise, right? Identify your source of what defines yourself. And ask yourself, hey, what really defines me? And you'll probably find that that's where your wisdom is likely to come from, if you have any. Oh, you have some. You have some. If I were to draw my 3D axes, say, I will see 3D because it's easier to show on a screen in 3D than in 6, I would maybe take, I don't know, science, uh, humor, and ethics, or something like that. So imagine this. And not every situation requires a lot of each of those. Every situation is different. And it's somewhere in there in that space is a blob where my wisdom comes from. And 
it moves around depending on the situation. If I want to, if I hesitate about telling you a politically incorrect joke right now, well, it's not so much the science axis that's going to determine if I tell it or not. It's going to be a mix of the ethics and the humor axis, right? And I've decided that's probably best if I don't tell the joke. <laughs> so, so find, find your wisdom space. And the blob of wisdom, or blob is not very good, let's call it the wisdom zone in it, that you have. And I'll, I'll, I'll do it with a disclaimer right here. I'm not approaching this, I'm a scientist. I'm not approaching this from the self-help, crystal rubbing, mystical energy guru angle, right? Uh, it's not about sitting under a pyramid and, and being at one with the universe. I'm just thinking this, this graph of your wisdom zone is a way of visualizing, you know, where do you think you get the stuff that makes you decide what to do with the data, the information, and the knowledge that you drink from that fire hose. So bringing it down to uh, the real world, um, this is what tells you how you're going to be voting. This is what tells you what fridge you're going to buy. This is what tells you how you're going to bring up your kids, right? And as we get more and more into a society where information and knowledge is essentially fully available and fully free, because we're getting closer to that. If you can download it, it's free. Um, it's going to influence everything. Uh, if you're hiring an employee, for example, uh, it used to be you hire somebody because they know stuff and they know how to do stuff. And I would actually venture to say that it should go more like this now. Knowing stuff can't be as important if you can just look it up. You have to know how to do stuff with it. And so the doing is important. And places where you learn by doing become more important. Places like, say, the uh, medical school at McMaster University, to uh, make my friend here happy. Um, they've been doing, they've been doing uh, hands-on learning for decades. They have small group learning. You learn together in talking verbally about stuff. And you, you go into the hospital from day one. The model's been copied everywhere else. Um, a place like Ryerson University's Digital Media Zone, where you can go and start your own company. You're an undergrad, you go start your own company. It's not part of the formal curriculum, but you go there and you can experiment and do that. That's how you learn how to do. Apprenticeship, research, applied research. That's what I do, right? It's the best way to, to learn stuff is to, and, and to increase your wisdom quota, quota is to go and, and, and do research on stuff. So I think that learning those ways are going, should be emphasized. To follow some of the talks we've heard today, I think that, that goes pretty well. Finally, I'd like to say that everything is on the web, even my ideas, apparently. So if there's too much information, it's coming at you too fast, slow it down. You've heard of the slow food movement, right? right? Slow food movement, OK. And you know, eat slowly, cook slowly, digest slowly have slow bowel movements, I don't know. Anyways, slow food, I'm saying let's do slow thought, which sounds kind of strange, but it helps you filter out all the noise that this information and knowledge that you don't really need, that you're drinking from uh, the fire hose to get. Go post knowledge. Go to the wisdom part of it and add value. Add value to everything you do, if you can, because it may take longer it may mean you watch, less, you watch less TV or Twitter less or whatever. But if you go with slow thought, if you go beyond knowledge into putting wisdom in everything you do, if you can, I think you'll find it'll be absolutely worth it. Thank you.